Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session on the importance of music, arts, and sport to foster creativity and innovation. It's a pleasure to see you all here in person, although I am told that we have over a thousand people watching this remotely. So please behave because you are being watched. So I'm sure that most of us know, which is why we're here, that almost as soon as motor skills are developed, children communicate through artistic expression. And we know from studies that the arts challenge us with different points of view. They compel us to empathize with others. We know that music stimulates the brain and music education improves and develops language skills in children. And we know that sport has both physical and psychological benefits for children and adolescents and beyond, I think, teaching them developmental skills, emotional skills and social skills. So to talk about centering music and arts and sport in education in a time when unfortunately they are becoming increasingly sidelined, particularly in K-12 education, I'm joined, I'm delighted to be joined by Juan Diego Flores, who is a globally recognized Peruvian operatic tenor, who alongside his roles has received his country's highest decoration, the, Grand, the Knight Grand Cross in the Order of the Sun of Peru, and the World Economic Forum's Crystal Award, which celebrates artists who not only excel in their art, but also help to improve the world around them. So welcome. I am also joined by Clarence Sidoff, who is not only one of the most successful players in the UEFA Champions League history, but as, because he's the first and only player to have won the Champions League with three different clubs. But he also speaks six languages. I've heard him speak three already this morning. He has he's had a career in the media as a football manager and as a philanthropist and social entrepreneur. And he has been honored by Suriname as commander of the High Order of the Yellow Star and a knight of the ONN. I'm also joined by, so welcome, I'm joined by Zara Mahmood, who is a Pakistani artist based here in Dubai, who holds degrees in fine art from the National College of Arts in Lahore and the University of the Creative Arts in the UK. Her works have been exhibited internationally, and she's currently teaching at the American University in Dubai and at Zayed University, as well as being a member of the band Sail In Tonight. So welcome, the three of you. Thank you very much for joining me today. We've got a few questions, and then we will open up to questions from the audience. But I'd like to start off, because I get that privilege. And I'd like to, discuss, to start by discussing the potential and the importance of music and arts and sport in building skills such as leadership, collaboration, problem solving, and strategic thinking. So my question is about how these disciplines improve these skills and why these skills are so important for the future. I'd also be interested to hear a bit about the synergies between, between these disciplines and perhaps the differences and the common benefits that they have for children. Juan Diego, in your acceptance speech for the Crystal Award, I'm gonna quote you here, you said how in an orchestra, in a chorus, children learn values that fill the spirit and makes them better, better human beings so that they, so that they can transform society. This attitude is contagious. It passes that set of values and attitudes to their families and communities. So perhaps you could start us off by telling us about why these skills are so important for creativity and innovation. Yes, um, when I, when I um, discovered that music can change communities, can change uh, uh, underprivileged kids to become better citizens overall, I decided to, to create, to found Sinfonia por el Perú. And it is true, uh, in an orchestra, in a chorus, uh, a kid from a poor background or for uh, an underprivileged uh, situation can learn values, can learn to, um, to share, can learn to, to be part of a whole. I consider an orchestra or a chorus like a mini society where the children can especially uh, develop and acquire self-esteem. This is very important. I think arts and sports and music can contribute much to society. And uh, to prove that, we did two uh, studies, one in 2000. Uh, 14 and then one in 2018, following two groups of, ch of children through four years, 
And in the first study in 2014, uh, it was, uh, the, the, the results were amazing. For example, the kids were better at school in mathematics. They were, uh, they had more self-esteem. They uh, received less uh, punishment at home. Uh, the child labor was reducing 90%. And then we continued with the study until 2018 that we did the second one. And these were two groups. One was the study group and the other one was the control group. And we kept studying the same group of people. Yeah? So in the second study, uh, of course, the kids were growing up all the time. <laughs> and uh, still, in the second study, there were different uh, variables. Like the kids wanted to pursue... Um, a graduate study, so they wanted to become even more uh, developed in uh, uh, in education, and this is very important because uh, in their environments normally they don't finish school, they don't finish even high school, so they have this aspiration to continue with graduate studies. Um, very importantly, uh, the, their aggressiveness towards others diminishes a lot. Teenage pregnancy, and this is very important, diminishes in 75%. So uh, overall, is uh, music, uh, we, we have um, uh, made studies that, uh, that have results, and this is important to continue to create evidence that music, art, sport, really can change within the society, can make better citizens, and can create better students also. Because when, when music, as in the studies, they, they have, uh, you know, uh, in the results, when, when music is, is uh, making better students in all grades in mathematics, is making, um, is making them better in their families, then this is the evidence. So we should really include it in the programs of the state, of the country. Music ha have to be in every school, in every uh, part of uh, the society, uh, including children and youth. Thank you. So I, I would like to come back to your point actually on evidence a bit later, because I think that's a really important one. But before I do, you mentioned some, some things that I didn't mention earlier about sharing, being part of a whole. Uh, developing aspirations and self-esteem. Clarence, I want to turn to you because you built a football stadium, I think, in Suriname, uh, where, among other things, the, the Juniors League of Suriname plays. Is that right? And so I wanted to ask your thoughts on the importance of, of sport in building these key skills, and if you see any similarities with what Juan, is, uh, Juan Diego has, has spoken about. Um, good morning, first of all. Um, yeah, in 2000, actually, uh, we built a stadium in Suriname uh, and we had an eight-year full league uh, running with ten different teams, uh, uh, youth teams, uh, and each of them were carrying a name of a value. Um, and, uh, I mean, it was uh, uh, sports activities, uh, after-school activities, but everything was value-driven and, and, and character-building. Um, you know, the discussion about what uh, sports, music, arts can mean for the development of kids is actually a bit uh, outdated. We know what it means, we know what it takes. It's actually a discussion, what is the leadership in the world going to do? And having this knowledge, this scientific knowledge, to start uh, modernizing, um, you know, the education for, for kids in the world. That is actually what, 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 what I'm more focused on and also, um, you know, initiatives, new initiatives, people that want to get into activities where kids are involved for their development um, and to have that scientific approach to it um, because the knowledge is there and it's not, it's not so difficult anymore to, to really uh, tap into that and, and to be conscious that especially with this uh, ever-changing, fastly changing uh, world, um, there is more and more need um, for this uh, new approach and and you know I'm, I'm actually now working on a few different projects uh, one is more digital and it's digital you use that platform to get them move more physically um, and, and another one is uh, Seyed of Habib uh, Performance Club which is a football school where we're going to mix football and artificial um, and um, uh, martial arts 
mixed martial arts to to develop all those skills that we know that that can be developed through through uh, through sports. Um, so yes, I can definitely uh, you know I love I love what I heard, uh, and and I believe that is that is what society needs to actually embrace much more. Why should it be only some individuals? doing some small you know projects at the end of the day when in my is my passion so i did and i said to my mother she was still worrying and i said listen i'm going to study three years here in the conservatory then i'm going to win a scholarship i'm going to go to america and then i'm going to start my career in europe and i didn't have any idea that that was going to happen but that happened you know and uh, i did i made my debut i was speaking to clarence that uh Probably he was there when I was singing at La Scala because somebody told me Clarence Seedorf is, is attending tonight's performance. And this is where I made my debut when I was 23 years old at La Scala. So for me, uh, it has been a, a journey, you know, follow your heart, I would say to the kids. Now I see how um, Sinfonia por el Peru, playing in orchestras, playing in choruses, Playing in bands, also we have programs for uh, special need uh, people. We have we have um, an atelier where the, the kids build their own violins, their own cellos, their own string instruments. We have many thousands of uh, of kids in the program, and we have impacted more than 30,000 people in 10 years. So, for me, it is very important that you find your path and you follow what you want to do. Uh, I remember a, a girl who told me once, she, she was a, a benef beneficiary of Sinfonia por el Peru, she was playing the violin and she said, I'm happy because Sinfonia por el Peru making music together have made me a better person and have made me want to be good. And if you, if you have to be um, um, a shoemaker, be the best shoemaker. If you have to be the best tripero, which means, you know, is the food that you make in the streets, be the best one. And she is now studying to become a doctor. Many of the kids in Sinfonia Pueblo Peru, they pursue uh, a career, if in music or in other um, thing, um, architecture, medicine, because music has changed their minds. And ha because I think poverty is not necessarily the lack of bread or the lack of roof. Poverty is the lack of um, self-esteem, you know, to, to feel nobody. And society really can forget people. And you can uh, feel forgotten. And you can feel that you don't have any identity and you don't have self-esteem or public esteem. Whenever you play an instrument, whenever you're making music together, creating beauty, then you feel somebody and then you can believe that there's a future for you because you are important. And you are not poor anymore because in your mind, the chip has been changed. You are poor because you're not poor because you have a, a mentality of a person who can really go on and have a future. Beauty together. I think that yeah. encapsulates it very well, and it goes back to what Zara was saying earlier about her students. Zara, you're a musician and an artist, or fine artist. Were you always going to be that? You know, I had that epiphany when I was seven. Um, I had. I've grown up in the UAE, and there was this supplication journal that used to come with Khalid Times, and a local-based artist by the name of Tina Ahmed. I always, always mention her because I remember a step-by-step -step guide to drawing and something just ignited in me. I got my watercolors out and I started following the steps. It's as simple as that. And it was something that I nurtured every single day. And um, I feel so privileged to say that I'm able to pursue what I love. But, you know, being a studio artist is a sort of career where you report to no one but yourself. So it can be a double-edged sword. You could be very complacent about meeting your objectives, or you could be very disciplined, uh, initiate your own projects, and make sure you're putting substantial amount of hours in a day. And that requires a lot of drive. And I've always worked from my home as far as my art is concerned. 
Sometimes that can be a bit challenging because it's isolating. You want to connect with other people. And uh, studio artists, sometimes they rent spaces in commercial areas just to get that feedback. Um, but you do what's best for you, what's feasible, what allows you greater productivity. But I feel very fortunate that I've gotten to know a lot of creative indi individuals in, in the UAE and back home in Pakistan because I feel like I'm in a position where it's exciting to know that unforeseen collaborations between creative people can occur. So that, you know, the fact that paths might cross is exciting. To speak about challenges, I mean, the irregularity of income that is associated with pursuing the career of a studio artist is a reality. And it is something that you must accept when you're getting into it, but you should not let it deter you from pursuing your dream, uh, especially when you're passionate about it and putting in the hours. The degrees that I have, they've helped me to secure jobs in teaching part-time, and that helps to fund my studio practice. So my advice to budding artists would be to not let the momentum of that creative process break. Nurture it like a child every single day, and also be open to exploring different disciplines. I think my... Um, the fact that I was able to record in a music studio in some way has impacted my visual language. And it was something that I didn't plan out, it was not scripted, it was a very spontaneous journey because my partner is a musician, but that opened a lot of, uh, it just set a lot of images in my head about where I could take my visual language. So I would really say to young people not to be rigid or purist when you go into a discipline that you identify as something that you like to pursue, the more you allow yourself to be open to experiences, your visual language becomes clearer, it becomes more aligned with who you are as a creative individual, and I think with time your work becomes less guarded and it just reveals a clearer truth, you're more honest, and because of that honesty you can connect with people as well. Yeah. Thank you. So. Touching on this and turning back towards education systems, I want to bring a few things that you've, you've said to me today together. In many education systems, and so full disclosure, I have been for a long time a teacher in K-12, and I still teach a little bit, and I've taught in three different continents in several different countries, and in pretty much all of them, funding for arts and music education particularly, but in some of them sport as well, is going downhill. It's getting less and less. So most of you have said something along the lines of um, having an inspiration or having somebody who really supported you younger, when you were younger, and then you've, you're living this because you've set up your own things in order to do that for, for young people. So that's potentially one thing, but I would like to ask you, what is it that you think the barriers are to including these disciplines in education systems? Um, why aren't they given more importance? I think we probably agree that they should be, otherwise we wouldn't be here. What would it take to make them a priority in education? You've mentioned evidence. You've also mentioned scientific rigor. Um, but I'd be particularly interested to hear about kind of opportunities, innovative approaches that you've seen or that you are working on um, to enhance the quality and availability of music and sport and art in education systems. I'd like to start with um, you, uh, Juan Diego, if that's okay. Well, <coughs> I think that uh, what we're doing is a first step. I mean, allowing a lot of kids to really have access to music mm -hmm. and to, to know it and to make music together and to become better students by doing that and better persons. Yeah, you, you, I mean, if you imagine a poor kid in Peru from a, from a poor neighborhood having a violin and playing Mozart or Beethoven or playing Peruvian music and that violin is, is, is the, the hope for the future. Yeah, um, not because they will be musicians, but because they will be better persons in whatever they choose to do. And if you also think that that instrument is replacing uh, a bunch of drug or, or, or a pistol, yeah, a firearm, this is very powerful and this is very, very important. Um, I mean, what we are doing is important. What we're doing is what it needs to be done. I mean, attracting kids. And I mean, they are, they are making music that, that for them is normal. Since they were six or seven, they were playing classical music. 
And they are not classical music for them. It's music. Yeah? And it's impacting so much in their lives and in their communities because also their parents admire the kids. How important is that a father or mother admires their kid and respects their kid? And this, in evidence, we have seen that they don't hit them anymore because there is a lot of hitting yeah? by the father who is probably, uh, you know, um, not a nice person, you know, or um, usually there's no, not a father in, in the household. Yeah? We're talking about kids that in many cases don't have even water in their houses. Yeah? And they have to walk hours to get to the music school, but they do. And they arrive there and they play together and they feel in a secure place. And the parents uh, thank so much the organization because we are giving them, the kids, a safe space to be there during the afternoons, you know. In the afternoons is when they are not going to school. And this is, in a way, a dangerous time. Because they can be roaming around, they can be um, getting together with gangs, they can be uh, working in the streets, because if they are not doing anything, their parents will send them to sell candy in the streets, and this is dangerous for them. Instead, they are playing in an orchestra. They are singing in a choir. They are making music together. And it's for free, of course. Yeah? And they feel great there. Because, of course, we are always monitoring and analyzing the data. They feel that they are taken care of. They feel that they are becoming better people. They feel that they are more intelligent. That they are fast. That they, they can um, s bring solutions to problems. And this is a wonderful thing. So more initiative like that, more we have to convince. We are the ones who have to convince politicians. Is the data that you're, that you're creating, is that convincing politicians? Is it, is it enough, do you find? Well, in, in my country, slowly. We, we have more support from abroad, hmm. from international uh, foundations, than from my country. And this is because uh, probably um, there's no so much belief that arts and culture will change the world. Mm. It's like, what? Singing? Playing? Come on. Playing football? Come on. But this is the answer. This is really the answer. Yeah? Einstein said it. Yeah? So we have to, we have to really uh, push more for that. And it's a little bit our responsibility also yeah? to try to convince politicians, policy makers, to bring these programs into action into schools mm. and, and build a better world from that. If, as a fellow artist, thank you, I, w I wanted to ask Sara what you see needs to happen, um, you know, building on Juan Diego's point about evidence in order to convince politicians and policymakers that this is still important. I think it simply goes down to just increasing the frequency with, the, which, with which these subjects are taught at school every week. Um, I have an eight-year-old daughter, and I, because of this uh, talk that we were having, I did a little bit of research and asked her, how many times do you have art in school? She said once a week, sometimes once in two weeks. And I have never taught at school level, but looking at university students and maybe just reminding and just imagining how things could improve if we increase the frequency with which these subjects were taught. Um, it would just mean better quality work coming out from students who graduate from school, which means at the local universities here, the portfolios that are submitted would be of a higher caliber, which means that university professors would get that chance to tweak the curriculum, incorporate more challenges, uh, so that by the time the students graduate, their works are of an even higher caliber. So I think as far as uh, opportunities in the art school, there's a lot that's happening here with Art Dubai that's homegrown. It's been around for over a decade. There's so many initiatives, open calls, but we need to just figure out how can we improve it from the roots. and. Um, it could be as simple as how you deliver a lesson. So if we're talking about leadership building qualities, one of the things that I mentioned was that the quality of a leader is to be able to see things from different points of view and to see things in new ways. So it's a common thing in drawing class to tell the students to hold a viewfinder, which is like a hollow frame, 
and you just put it in front of you, it's like a lens, and you look at the entire space, and, but you're composing different frames and looking at details of everyday items, and it allows them to see things in a new light rather than focusing on the entire room. So when they're doing that, they're doing it in a very compliant way. That's how education system is in the early years. They have to follow compliance. Why don't we give them a voice? Give them an agency. Ask them what they think the qualities of a leader are. And then introduce the projects accordingly so that they're going into it consciously as well. They feel a bit empowered about the fact that their views matter. And I feel like, you know, if you just start tackling things that way, building in artistic components in a science project. So if you have to write a report on an experiment that you've conducted, put in an artistic component and say, illustrate what you've done. So that way, visual communication sort of filters in in all the subjects, if it's tricky to teach art more than once a week. But at least students will not be afraid. Because I feel like right now these subjects are so niche that those who have access passion or have parents who pursued it and they're getting the support, they, they can comfortably get into this field and they're happy with doing it once a week as an extracurricular activity. But for those who are not so confident, it's so easy for them to opt out. Yeah. And uh, we need to just make people familiar with the practice. So thank you. This point about extracurricular activities, sport in many countries is an extracurricular activity. It's not something that's built into the education system. Before we turn to our audience to ask them their questions, what would you say we could do in order to really ingrain sport into the education system better in order to equip uh, young, young people and adolescents with the skills that they could gain yeah. from it? Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think everything goes back to leadership um, and not leadership in terms of teaching leadership, but the leaders in the world um, and to have a little bit more of vision and courage and also uh, care. Uh, we need some more spirituality. If we want to start implementing certain things, we need to care about those who are coming. Everything will start from there. Um, the decisions that we make as leaders, um, whether it's on country level, it's from the school level is from any organization level is based on making the lives of who we're serving better and uh, as, as long as, as the um, attention is lying on other stuff you just said that um, and we know that that they're cutting uh, exactly in these type of activities in the schools um, i will give you just an example there was a kid that uh, was struggling with uh, math and um, they were just adding hours, extra hours uh, after school and it went down and down and down and down and then all of a sudden uh, that kid started to do activities uh, within a group sport activities which sports is the basis because the human being needs to move we move and then we increase our capacities, whatever it is, is it motorial, is it cognitive, and then we can get into the art and the music and everything. But with, without that basis, when we are small babies, we start running, we start, why is all of that? It's nature. And we know this, this is what I'm saying before, it's science. We don't have to reinvent what has already been told for many, many years. So I think that the challenge that we have is to get from the leadership, from the countries, on government level, on international level, to really uh, get a focus because to improve all the classes, whether it's math, languages, it doesn't matter what, the basis under that that can improve the skills to learn, simply to learn better, is sports. And um, this is not my opinion, fortunately. Uh, this is really science. And so it's just, um, um, uh, uh, the focus point and it's wonderful to have people uh, that are obviously doing projects and uh, making a difference and uh, we should shine shine the lights on, on those people in those projects to set an example again um, and also I believe that the business community can do much more because sometimes it's uh, good to challenge the politicians and the leaders and everything but it's also important that the business the big businesses uh, can do so much more for community. I, I do believe it's increasing. I do believe the people in the world are more sensitive to, to support you know, the companies that are also looking um, to give back. Um, because we, we have, there's so many good uh, best practices in the world to, to, to really support what we are talking about here. 
Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, my panelists, Clarence, Juan Diego, and Zara. We do have time for some questions. I should have some on the app, but I'm going to need some technical assistance to find them. But if any of you have questions, please raise your hand. I think there's a microphone that will come round. Yes, gentlemen in the front here, and a microphone is coming to you just there. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the enlightenment, and, and uh, it was a very informative session. Uh, one question that popped up uh, in my mind while I was listening to uh, great speakers is uh, that the shift of uh, shift in the technology or the advancement in the technology where uh, tablets have become mandatory in schools and you know especially in colleges also where uh, people are more into their tablets and electronic devices rather than notebooks and uh, spending more time in drawing and painting and uh, singing and uh, going outside their uh, comfort zone, outside their houses and playing with friends, which encourages uh, such things like creativity, innovation, and encourages arts and culture. So uh, how do we, uh, firstly, do we uh, see this as a challenge? Uh, and if we see this as a challenge, how do we overcome this challenge? And what advice we need to give uh, to the future generation who are uh, uh, to get out of their video games for some time and go for, uh, uh, you know, uh, music competition or art competition and things like that. Yeah. Who would like to answer that one? Go for it. Just uh, maybe, maybe just shout. Yeah. Well, anyway. Uh, oh. oh, yeah. I think the mic's on now. Um. <laughs> Tablets, digitization. Yeah, we, we can't fight technology within the generation. We need to use it properly and also just add the hours with all the activities that are necessary that we are speaking about. Um, um, I'm self going to be launching, um, I think mid next year, uh, a digital platform, digital. So I'm, I'm, I'm using their world. But through that platform, they will be able to do all kinds of physical exercises. We're going to use football. We're going to use all, um, for example, a trivia. So they can also think about solutions very fast. They have maybe three seconds to come up with a solution to decide certain things. We're going to make, focus on the physical, the tactical, the, um, <coughs> uh, the mental, and the technical area. But all of these things actually are things we can translate back into life. So what I'm saying with this is that it's, it's up to our creativity to create the proper environment for them to develop. We need to reinvent a little bit what the system is. And another thing that I wanted to add is that we are talking about the more civilized uh, countries and they have an issue actually with the system. But what about those who don't have access? And that is why this digital uh, digitalization is important because we can go and reach you know the rural areas around the world uh, with with connecting them to the mobile phone who that, that actually uh, is much more uh, spread out now so I think it's really solutions that that are there and implement them in the system thank you we've got time for one more question yes sir thank you um, well first of all thank you very much to the panelists my question is in, um, in terms of the word art itself. And, I, and I'm sure, I mean, Juan touched on this whole idea about the family telling them that art might not be the perfect career um, in terms of because it's also not a career where you make money and unless you really make it. Um, I come from also the same generation where you needed to be either a doctor or an engineer. And when the word art kind of is looked at as kind of like a tier two, unless you really are make it well, the fact is, Artists are the ones with the masses of people following and the masses of people like who are following. So my question is, how do you change that perception um, of <coughs> artists globally? And specifically, that's my first question. How do you actually change that mindset of people around the word art? And the second question that I have is, is there enough data specifically in areas where there is high poverty? where art programs have been introduced and then the results came in that poverty has been reduced or crime has been reduced due to the fact that there's art programs in these areas. Thank you. Yes. Um, about the last bit of it, yes, because um, 
um, there is a there is a part that says that in the studies that said that the kids that are in the in the programs they uh, are protected yeah they continue uh, their studies also into a graduate level that means they are not following maybe the obvious path of you know not finish not finishing school and being you know being into the mercy of 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 the streets yeah it until now we don't have that data specifically you know but it's very difficult also to calculate you know if you know the crime has been reduced how and yeah but we have the data that demonstrates that the kids are, are following a path now we are not creating uh, musicians in Sinfonia Pro Peru at least we are not creating professional musicians that will make it yeah we are creating um, a better society we're transforming the 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 situation of those kids yeah that normally they don't have many opportunities yeah and we are changing their their mindset and preparing them for life whatever they want to be whatever they want to achieve in their lives yeah? we can see it now that many want to be musicians but many are opting for other careers uh, but but all of them or at least the 90% of them, they want to become something to help others because they were helped in Sinfonia Pro Peru, yeah? And they want to do something in, in the social world to help others. Many say, I want to work as a, as a, as a lawyer in Sinfonia Pro Peru to help or as a doctor in Sinfonia Pro Peru. So they want really to be social workers in their fields yeah and this is fantastic you already changed because they think the world is like that you have uh, made them think that the world is made to help others be better off so this is wonderful i think thank you very much yeah i would love to add um in in holland uh in 2008 uh, we created uh, with my foundation, we supported with my foundation, a, uh, um, a playground. But it was uh, outdoor and it was indoor. Indoor, there were um, different activities uh, with art and music and outdoor was all sports related. Um, and the measurement of the impact was done by the local police. So there was already a um, bit of crime going on, um, a lot of kids hanging around, as uh, Juan Diego said before. And because of that activity, after school activity, it, in three months time, it was reduced by 70% uh, immediately. Police report, so it's as simple as that. Kids need to have to something to do. And, and, and so we need to create an environment. So I think that, you know, again, projects like these, we've heard them, you know, many who's interested, we see them, we hear them, we try to support them. And, and uh, again, it's up to those leaders from business and uh, from, from the politics to, to support these projects and to have them grow. So they don't know how to do it, but you don't, they don't have to know it, right? It's, uh, somebody already knows. So this is actually a good <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so I think, ooh, I think you've all heard what you need to do. You need to go home tonight, pick up that tennis racket that's in the corner, go and open the cover of the piano that's been sitting in the corner for a while, get yourself a viewfinder and do a little, uh, do a little sketch or encourage somebody else to do the same. All it leads me to do is to thank my panelists, Zara Mahmoud, Juan Diego Flores and Clarence Seedorf. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.